Welcome back to Fly Fishing Hatches, Part 10. I'm Raj Kletke, and in this part we'll be looking at and tying flies for the post-emergence caddis hatches. The post-emergence caddis hatches include, in reverse order, the spent caddis and egg-laying caddis. Let's first cover spent caddis. After emergence, caddis often live for weeks to a month, much longer than mayflies do. During that time, caddis mate and the females return to the water to lay eggs. Some will return multiple times to lay eggs. Some will ultimately become exhausted while laying eggs and will die on the surface or underwater. Others will return to the stream side and die there so they wouldn't be available to fish. Spent caddis on the surface of the water are usually not in the numbers or synchronized fashion that a mayfly spinner fall occurs. I've not seen and therefore not fished a spent caddis hatch, so I don't have a specific pattern to recommend, but recommendations are easily found online. However, I have fished, and I suspect you fished a caddis egg laying hatch, possibly without even knowing it. Caddis lay their eggs in three basic locations. Some lay their eggs out of the water on vegetation, branches, dry to muddy areas that will be in the water at a future time, or even dropping the eggs from above the water. Generally, these caddis will not be available to the fish. Some lay their eggs on the water surface, touching down multiple times, so they are intermittently vulnerable. Others lay their eggs underwater. Some of these land on the surface and then swim underwater. Some land on plants, rocks, or other structures, even your waders, and crawl underwater. And some dive from above the water to underwater. While this sounds a little complex, you really only need two patterns for egg-laying caddis. One for on the surface and one for subsurface. The elk hair caddis is quite good for the egg-laying caddis on the surface and even egg layers that are on the surface only briefly before they swim underwater. Pulling the elk hair caddis underwater will often work for the underwater caddis egg layers also, but there are better patterns for that. So let's tie some patterns. The first fly we'll tie is an elk hair caddis. While occasionally useful during an emergence hatch when the newly emerged adults are scampering across the surface towards shore, it's best to think of this fly as a mature egg-laying caddis. I do tie this slightly different than the classical method. Here I've already tied in the hackle near the bend of the hook, put dubbing on my thread, and taken one wrap of dubbing behind the hackle. Next, I put the hackle in the material holder clip and wrap the dubbed body forward, leaving a little over a hook eye's length at the front of the hook before tying the dubbing off. As you can see, I like using my rotary vise to wrap dubbing as I can easily control how tight or loose I want the dubbing with my right hand. But wrapping the dubbing in the usual fashion is fine, of course. Sometimes I put in a half hitch to hold the thread in place, but often I don't. I then palmer the hackle forward. Here I have the concave side forward and am making a bushy elk hair caddis. You can change the density of the hackle, of course, by wrapping fairly tight spirals or looser spirals. Near the front of the hook, I always put in a few extra ha hackle wraps before tying off. And then cutting off the excess hackle. Be sure to leave space to attach the wing and be sure that the area is well covered with thread so that the wing doesn't roll around the hook. Here I've stacked deer hair to get the tips even and have pre-measured and pre-cut the wing. Control your thread kick and keep your fingers tight against the far side of the hook to prevent the wing from rolling around the hook. After tying the wing on tight, I pull the butt ends of the wing up 
to form a head and take some thread wraps around the hook just behind the eye. I then whip finish and cut off the excess thread. This gives a very bushy fly, which skitters well on the surface in riffles and is quick to tie. The fish don't seem to mind, but if you want a slightly neater fly, wrap the hackle with the convex side of the hackle forward and cut off the hackle fibers above the hook. This time I've stacked the deer hair to even the tips, but I didn't pre-cut the wing. Again, keep your fingers tight against the far side. After securing the wing, lift the wing butt straight up and put thread wraps in front of the butts to hold the head up and get ready to tie off. Release your bobbin and cut off the excess wing butts. Then whip finish and cut off the thread. The elk hair caddis certainly looks neater now and it may make sense to use this variation on flat water. I admit though that I usually tie the bushier one as it's quicker to tie. Now let's tie our subsurface or diving caddis. I often use a heavy hook, but generally don't further weight it. A standard dry fly hook would be fine also. After I've dubbed the body, I choose soft feather fibers for the underwing. Any of the feathers you use for soft hackles would likely work fine. I have lots of pheasant tail feathers, so I commonly use fibers from one of those. Pull the fibers perpendicular to the stem so the ends align and then cut off a clump. Attach those fibers to the top of the hook and then attach some clear antron yarn that you've brushed out into individual fibers. You can attach it either as a single strand or use half the thickness, attach in front, and then double it over. This will help you form a neat head upon which to wind your hackle. Wind on a couple of wraps of a rooster, in other words, stiff hackle fibers. Don't overdo it. This is a little heavy in this particular picture, but use rooster hackle. Put on a small head, whip finish, and cut off the excess thread. So why the stiff front hackle? Isn't this supposed to be fished underwater like swinging a wet fly? Why not a soft hackle? Well, actually, I'm tempted to try a soft hackle also, but the theory is that caddis generally lay their eggs in a riffle, so that's where you'll be fishing this fly. With tension on the fly in a riffle, a soft hackle would fold back while a stiffer hackle may maintain action. I'm not sure the hackle matters that much, but I do believe that the antron is the important feature. Remember, these caddis started in the air, and as they get underwater, their wings and body will retain fine air bubbles which give bright spots of light. The antron also retains fine air bubbles. Just be sure to treat the fly with a powdered desiccant frequently. Incidentally, I know others like the bird nest fly with desiccant. I've not fished that fly, but likely it would work well also. <clears throat> so I use these two flies for egg laying caddis. The elk hair caddis for fishing the surface and the diving caddis for fishing the subsurface egg layers. The sizes would be similar to what you've previously tied for caddis, mainly 14s to 18s. The colors would be somewhat similar, but generally darker and less bright than you used on the X caddis. These are mature caddis, and most species darken within hours after emerging. Again, while these are the fly patterns I use, if you already have your own favorites, stick with them. Fishing a fly confidently and therefore correctly is often more important than the pattern you choose. So how do you know when caddis are laying eggs? If you're on a trout stream much, you've seen swarms of caddis flying upstream. Unfortunately, these are usually male swarms, and while important to nature to help redistribute caddis back upstream, have virtually no significance to the fisherman except to, assure, to reassure him or her that caddis are present on this stream. In spite of the excitement these swarms create in me and other fishermen, these swarms are not an indication that a hatch is taking place. Caddis usually live for several weeks, as we've already mentioned, and some may return to the stream several times to lay eggs. 
Egg laying goes on sporadically for long periods of time. While sporadic egg laying, especially for a few species, may occur during the day, which I believe is why the Alcair caddis makes such a good searching fly, the sporadic egg laying is more common in the evening or even at night, while subsurface egg laying, which we'll discuss next, is more common. I'll usually try an Alcair caddis during these very sparse sporadic egg laying hatches, if you can even call them hatches, as even the subsurface egg layers usually return to the surface. And when caddis are this sparse, the trout are likely looking up but haven't become selective, so will commonly take a surface fly also. Occasionally egg layers will be common enough that you'll see intermittent rising fish. Watch for what they're taking if possible. If in the correct seasonal setting, no other organisms are seen and the trout are taking something off the surface, in other words, you're seeing some little bubbles in the rise forms, I'd likely try an Alcair caddis, but I would usually add a midge dropper also if this is during the day. Anyway, think of the Alcair caddis as representing a fully formed egg laying caddis rather than a fly to use during the emergence hatch. <clears throat> Heavier concentrated caddis egg laying hatches also occur. These may be in the evening or night, but seem especially common during a caddis emergence. You may have even started fishing the hatch as an emergence hatch, which is what I've probably already done too. But remember, birds pick off many caddis flies, so it makes sense that for better survival, emergences and egg laying should be done when the numbers of caddis can overwhelm the bird's ability to catch them. I'm not sure that this is correct scientifically, but it makes sense to me and reminds me to try the subsurface caddis as an egg layer if my pre-emergence strategy is not working. The subsurface caddis egg layers, as we discussed earlier, may land on the surface and then swim under, may crawl down a plant, rock, your waders, etc., or may dive from the air making small pops as they hit the surface. Occasionally, bad casts that smack your fly to the water may draw attention to the trout for the aerial divers. Trout may take the caddis on the way down as they actively swim to the bottom, or more likely, after they lay their eggs and start back up. Some will just drift back to the surface after laying eggs, making an easy target, while others will actively swim back to the surface. Some will die, expired after egg laying, and drift with the current. Some that come to the surface may rest briefly before breaking through the surface tension, again, especially on flat water, but again, usually you'll be fishing riffles. So the trout may be taking passive or active caddis at any level of the water column. Start with a, wet fly swing, with a wet fly swing and then experiment with levels and actions until you start catching fish. Do remember, however, that these are fairly tiny insects, so don't overdo the movement in a riffle. How many subsurface egg layers are there? There are some differences of opinion, perhaps different species within a genus lay eggs differently, but you will see from this greatly abbreviated list that the majority of the common caddis you'll fish in a season lay their eggs subsurface. This is also an abbreviated list of the common caddis that lay their eggs predominantly on the surface. Note that Brachycentris and Microsema are both on both lists. Each of these genera have multiple species which lay eggs differently. You don't really need to know or be able to identify the genera or the species. Ask at the fly shop or, if necessary, just assume you're dealing with the subsurface egg layers during a post-emergence hatch unless you see adults being taken off the surface or bubbles in the rise form. Most of the time you will be correct. Let's quickly summarize fishing the common caddis hatches by fly type. We didn't tie any larval patterns in this video because while they may be involved in a hidden hatch, as I explained earlier, I've not knowingly fished one of these hatches. 
but the caddis larva patterns are excellent for searching patterns. For each species, there will be larvae that are available for many months of the year and occasionally may be part of a hidden hatch. Prior to pupation, the larva is significantly larger than the pupa or adult will be. Have larva patterns for free-living caddis to fish in fast riffles, retreat case, also known as net spinning caddis for moderate waters, and cased caddis for fast to slower waters. Who knows, you may be fishing a hidden hatch when you think that you're searching. There are numerous videos on tying caddis larval patterns, which you can find online, and most of these patterns are very easy to tie. The pupa and emerger patterns should be your dominant flies during the pre-emergence and emergence phase of a hatch. Which is best at any time may be difficult to figure out. I usually try both, using the pupa pattern as a dropper off the X caddis and let the fish decide. Then I can go to a single fly, which allows me to fish it properly. Except when the adults are scampering across the surface. Again, think of the adult patterns as egg laying patterns. I use the Alcare caddis as the surface egg layer and the diving caddis as the subsurface egg layer. Especially surface egg laying may be sporadic, so the Alcare caddis is also an excellent searching dry fly, but the subsurface diving caddis pattern will likely be the most useful for the subsurface egg laying that you'll see in great enough numbers to really be considered a hatch. Of course, it's not always as simple as this video suggests. Fly fishing would lose its charm if it was always predictable and easy. Some authors suggest having at least six different patterns to fish an emergence hatch and additional patterns for other caddis hatches. Check with the local fly shops for the current hot patterns, ask friends, and ask successful fishermen on the waters you fish. As always, use fly patterns that you have confidence in, but remember the principles in this video. Especially remember again that the fully formed adult is an egg laying caddis. You're likely to be very disappointed if you try to use it during an emergence hatch. If you're just starting to fish caddis hatches, try using the fly patterns I've tied in this video in appropriate sizes and colors for the caddis on your stream. You'll have a good start on most caddis hatches, and you can always add other sizes, patterns, and variations as you gain experience. Soon I bet your fly box will be as full, as full of caddis patterns as mine is. Before we leave caddis, I do want to cover a couple of specific hatches that I do use slightly different patterns for and show you a very simple caddis pattern that I think you'll enjoy tying and fishing. So join me again for part 11 of this series when we'll briefly discuss and tie flies for the Little Black Caddis and the October Caddis. I'm Raj Kletke and I'll see you soon.